inside the yeah, I don't know. Never worn these in the helmet. Malcolm, uh, well, sometimes he calls and I don't answer. So <laughs> maybe I would talk to him more. No, I'm just kidding. Malcolm has always been unapologetically himself. He's always been really fun, really positive person to be around. Like I can't say that much for myself. I had to breathe. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to eat roost. I gotta open my mouth. <laughs> there's there's weeks go by where we talk every single day, sometimes multiple times a day, and then there'll be a week or so that goes by where we don't talk. I go look fast. Like me, Jordan, my other brother, and Malcolm, uh, we've always been super tight. Probably his beard. Like, I can't grow a beard, so... <laughs> I like, I'm jealous of his beard. It's the only thing I'm jealous of in life. He's like the younger version of my dad. He's into motorbikes, he's like a family man. You know, they don't have kids, but I mean, Gooley and their cats, they're like their family, and you know, he's like the best uncle to my kids. He's a family man, even though he doesn't have kids, for sure. You wake up in the morning and you go to work. I'm like, no, oh, that's draining. What do I want to do? And I like to start my day off. I might be on a Wednesday morning at 8 a.m. outside in the sunshine reading the test on a 1981 Suzuki PE250. I've got my dad's old collection of magazines that, thank goodness, he held on to. And I've kind of built a little bit of a bigger collection through it. And I've got these cool, like, 1970s, 1980s, even some 1960s, like, magazines and motorcycle newspapers. And I think part of it's, you know, I'm so close to my father and, like, me and my dad had a pretty special relationship and he held on to these things. And like, that's the era he grew up in. It's so cool to have that old stuff. Usually by then I need to get a little bit of exercise for me and the dog. We kind of complement ourselves that way. I've got a four-year-old Australian Shepherd who needs exercise as much as I do, so. I live in a pretty amazing place where I've got trails right out of the backyard. I can walk out the back door, hop on the mountain bike, and having the dog that I have, it's uh, extra motivation to make me stay consistent because that's, that's the biggest thing. Malcolm is a very strong motivator for me to get off the couch. A lot of my childhood in Vernon, I'd have the typical, you know, you, you go to school, but when I got home, it was, I want to be in the garage with dad working on bikes, or he might even pick us up at school with his 1990 Ford Cube van. There'd be bikes in the back and up the hill we go and we go riding. So we like all jumped in our Cube van. My dad drove this little Cube van and we'd spend so much time together. You know, we didn't grow up with a lot. Like we don't come from money or anything like that. We saw my dad and my mom work 16, 18 hours a day, sometimes longer and really grind it out just, you know, to give us a good childhood. They always shielded us from that. We didn't know that things were that tight when we were kids. Now that we're adults, like they've told us the stories how they sold the washer and dryer one month just to make a mortgage payment. And my mom is washing clothes by hand and hanging them up beside five motorcycles. <laughs> So it's like, you could sell one motorcycle and get a washer and dryer, but dad's, nope, this is it. This is our family activity. This is what we do together. The one thing that was solid was that there was always bikes and that was kind of what glued us together.
I had a detailed plan written out in my bedroom. I had a piece of paper and I wrote Malcolm Hat number four, factory Suzuki. And underneath that I wrote, I will have $100,000 American salary from America Suzuki. I will race the GNCC series and National Enduro series. I wrote that out and said, this is my life plan. This is it. And by the time I was 15 years old, I was engulfed in this and I was already measuring like my self-worth and who I was as a motorcycle racer. The track in my yard there, it's Enduro Cross it's called. It's like off-road motorcycle racing condensed into a track. A motocross track but with obstacles. These skills that you need to develop they're spread out. You might see that once in a race. Well, I ride for 20 minutes. I see that obstacle 15, 20 times. What I love about that Duro Cross, it's obstacle after obstacle. You have to stay sharp. Your mind has to be on. Your body has to be on. There's no brakes. My track speaks to my weaknesses and to my strengths. And part of my track, I've got a small metal ramp there. You know, I can set it up with a 40, 50, 60 foot gap. So when I approach that jump, I have to make sure I'm in the right gear, the right RPM, hitting it at the right speed. So you gotta be sharp, you gotta keep the air awareness. Air awareness is different than rock awareness or log awareness. It's all different aspects of the same thing. That kind of thing keeps me on my toes, keeps my speed up, keeps me sharp in the air. I've kind of developed the track to have a few different lines about these logs that are kind of running parallel. And if you wanna hop onto those quick, you gotta ride the top of them. You don't wanna go into the groove, so it develops balance. A quick twitch to bunny hop on those logs and then hop right off of them. So you approach it and you lighten your front end, but then you keep your front end light. You don't want it to come down until you feel that back wheel contact and you can accelerate off. Getting wheels locked into a rut and a berm and accelerating is like, whew, that's a nice feeling too. Like, I live for that stuff. So we've got those back corners that are tight corners. They're tough to go through fast, they're not flowy. It's just to approach that, lock those wheels, and you can accelerate out really hard. Those fast corners, you get into those, that leads right into like a 40 foot long rock pit. That rock pit, I make lines develop in there. So I jump up and I stay center and I know there's a big flat rock in the top and I ride down the incline and I can look ahead at the end and I can gas it and get out of those rocks fast. And then I get too comfortable. So I go back to that rock pit and I'll spend 10 minutes and I'll just lift and heave whole rocks and I'll move rocks around. And I'll take this big boulder that I've been relying on for placement and I'll just take it out or I'll move it to the right side. So then I'll jump into that rock pit and I'll be like, oh, this is different. When it's back to back to back to back, nonstop obstacles, you're just dancing through there, trying to get the feel for everything the way you weight your bike. You know, you can't have all your weight on the front end through a rock pit like that. Like, you gotta dance through that. So one part of my track, which you'll see a version of what they call a log matrix. If you go to any kind of indoor enduro cross race, there's typically gonna be like five to 10 logs. They'll be spaced out less than a bike length, more than a bike length, different every time. That's where a lot of people fall apart. The timing is always different. So it's not the hardest matrix in the world, but it's tough enough that I don't clean it every lap. Like I've made mistakes in that more than once. So I'll do a 20 lap moto. Sometimes I'll do it 20 times. Sometimes I'll mess it up five times. I figure these timing things out and I get comfortable with it. It's like, okay, I'm comfortable, I'm jumping through this. I just turn around, I start riding laps backwards. That's where it's like having two tracks at once. We, we carpooled and went to this race in Odessa, Washington. It's called the Desert 100. And I come into that thing hot and I'm like, okay, a good winter of training. I'm fast, I'm deadly. I'm gonna go win this desert race. My sister and I went down together and 
how this race works is two 50 mile loops. The B riders do 50 miles, the A riders do two laps for a total of 100 miles. I was racing 50 miles, he was racing 100. In a desert race, you're 20, 30 feet left or right. There's different lines you can go and pick. I'm getting dusted out by this guy in a KTM in front of me and I go right 15 feet because a line develops that way. But this line leads into this deactivation gully kind of thing, you know, 15, 20 feet across. I get out of the dust and I'm fourth gear, wide open, 20 feet from me, I see the ground sink away. My heart drops and I'm like, I don't know what that is. Like, and it's happening fast. I locked the brakes up for a second and I'm like, no, that's not gonna work. It was like time slowed down. And I'm like, do you wanna hold these brakes on and skid into this or do you wanna gas it? So I decided gas it. So I just fan the clutch and I gas it into this gully and I'm in the air and I, I know I'm not gonna make it. So I try to push my bike down and jump over the handlebars, but I can feel my handlebar touch the top of my foot. And that just kept me with the bike. And we just toppled into the backside of that the ravine there. And whatever my leg and knee hit, whether it was the bike or a rock, instantly it just shattered my kneecap. And I got these two big gashes on my leg. Uh, Malcolm's pretty fast on a bike. So he finished his 100 miles before I finished my 50, but I came back to the to the trailer and I was like, that's weird. Like, we got like his boots here and you know, he's got like some gear kind of randomly strewn about, but his bike's not here. And I kind of took a closer look and I was like, oh, that's a lot of blood, you know? There's some blood in his boot and his, his knee brace and I'm like. But I just start hollering. I'm like, no, F, 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 F. And I put my hand out and I'm holding my leg and I'm screaming. And I start sliding on my butt to get back up to the top of this thing and my bike's 10 feet down. And there was a photographer like 50, 60 yards down, down the way. And he comes over there and this is about mile 30 to 35 of a hundred mile race. Thinking to myself, I'm like, well, and at this point in my life, I'd never timed out. I'd never DNF'd a race. I had never started something and not finished it. And I was like, I'm not doing that. I'm not quitting. Can you guys please, I'm Canadian. Can you guys please get my bike out of the ravine and bring it up here? Okay. And they get the bike up. I'm like, okay, I need you guys to lift me up. Just get me on my bike, I'm gonna finish the loop. And uh, another 50 miles through the desert and I'm on one leg and I, I lost all mobility in that knee. Come through the finish line and I'm looking around, I don't see the ambulance, I don't see the medics. I'm like, I'm in a lot of pain. And I'm like, I'm gonna go to the trailer and assess myself here. And I take my right boot off and the whole inside of my boot is just full of blood. So I, I rode over there and sure enough, he's there and he was sitting on the edge of the ambulance and he said, I think I broke something in here, in my knee, my leg, and I think I, I cut my artery, there's a lot of blood. And they said, no, you wouldn't be sitting here talking to me if you did that. But because of our like compression pants and knee braces and boots, everything holds things so tight, it had stopped it from bleeding. So he actually was able to race the race in this condition. I watched them take his knee brace and everything off. He grabs it behind my calf and he bends my leg a little bit and the cuts open up. It literally shot blood out of his leg into like the paramedic's face. And they were like, oh. I can see panic in his eyes. I'm like, I'm not supposed to be the calm one here. Like, it's okay, man. Like, yes, it's a, he's like, this is a lot of blood. This is not good. You need to go to the hospital now. Like, you I'm like, well, I'm in the back of an ambulance. Let's go. <laughs> and he's like, I'm not the driver. I can be in the back. I'm, I'm, so Victoria picks me up and she puts me in her truck. She drives me to the Odessa hospital and she goes inside quick. And she's like, I need a wheelchair. I need help getting my brother out. And I remember being like eyes closing and like, oh, I don't, I don't feel very good. And they bring me into the hospital. They say, we need to do this now. My sister came, they didn't say anything. And she just kind of slinked into the corner and watched the whole thing happen. One nurse got up on top and straddled him and, and she said, okay, like this is gonna hurt, but I have to get in there and find your artery. She's a smaller woman in small hands and she puts her hand inside. And I'm like, this is pain. And then the one lady's like, I got it, I got it. Oh, and they're like, don't look, don't look down. Don't look at us, don't look. And so I look up and I'm like, your ceiling is a mirror. I can see, I can see your hand. He's looking up and you can literally see everything they're doing in the ceiling. So they're like, well, just close your eyes or something then. <laughs> it's like, so this went on for a while and they finally got them all stitched up. I took an x-ray and they were like, this is shattered. They went in, did another little surgery on the spot and then they wired my kneecap back together. And Okay, Canadian, that's it. You're good, get out of here. They gave me a big leg immobilizer. He's like, don't move your leg. I don't know how you can combine ruining the upholstery of a vehicle and bleeding all over it, having a nurse's hand inside your knee, peeing on an Arby's door and being dragged up a staircase on a blanket by your sister, like in a 12 hour frame, but that's what he did. The 
this is where I live. Up there is where my wife lives. <laughs> Is that helmet sticker? <laughs> That's so sweet. Love that. Jordy basically keeps Malcolm alive. <laughs> That's <laughs> like from the time they met, we were like, are you sure, Jordy? But. Okay. Yeah, she's like this angel sent down for him, and I don't know, he wouldn't, I don't know how he would make it through without her. Like, I don't even want to think about that. Like, she's been his nurse and, and his driver and all these things. Like, she's put him back together more times than I'm sure she could count, so. She's been, yeah, she's been the, the rock for sure. weeks ago we were out at, at Silver Star um, doing all the downhill runs like this is my third time I've been out there and I'm there with Malcolm there with our friend Josh and we're we're hitting these black diamond runs and you know I'm trying to match speed and I'm trying to push myself as, as hard as they're pushing. I rode bicycles a lot growing up like if it wasn't a motorcycle it was a bicycle I, I it's like every day there was a bike every day somewhere in my life. There's a lot of instances especially behind Malcolm where I find like I'm going above and beyond what I ever really thought I was ever capable of. You know, I'm, I'm comfortable on a tabletop because I can I can case that, no problem, bounce down the other side, it's whatever. But when you get in those, those big lip doubles and stuff that we're hitting and it's like, I would never fathom, you know, you push it out of your brain, all the, the doubt and the stuff and you just kind of stare at his back tire and see what's going on. And I've surprised myself m more times than I can count doing that. This is disrupted. This is disrupted. And this bone's just blown apart, so we just spat it with those things. Uh, yesterday I had a good appointment with my surgeon. We're nine weeks out of surgery right now. Instead of two to three weeks, we're going to try to cut it down to 24 hours. And we're about to try to take my first step uh, right now. Woo! 
So we headed up the mountains outside of Vernon for the ninth annual Squealing Pig event. What's a squealing pig, you ask? This is a hare scrambles. Um, the riders, depending on their riding ability, they'll either go a two-hour or a three-hour course. They'll try and um, complete as many laps within that time frame that they can. And whoever completes the most laps within that time frame wins their particular class. You know, I can't be into vintage bikes in a magazine and not be into vintage bikes. So I've got this one yellow tank, 1969 TC120, and that's called my mailbox bike. I cruise out of the garage, I ride down to my mailboxes, which are a couple kilometers down the road, and pick my mail up, and I can connect. Like it's, it's like that bike is alive, that 1960s bike. I live right above a lake, so I ride down to the lake. My dog, right behind me in tow, he chases me on the bike as we cruise down to the lake. I pull on the parkway. That, you know, 50 plus year old kickstand just goes down just like it used to, and we jump in the lake, and me and my dog have a good time, and when we ride it back up. Hey, swinging a leg over an old Suzuki and going for a ride down the road, that speaks to me, so I'm gonna do it. Let's go. I think when anybody, especially a son, when they're younger and they respect their father, they look up to their dad quite a lot and how much uh, Rob Hett did for the sport, for people in, even in the community, Malcolm really looked up to that and I think he wanted to mold into that. 
but I knew he had 100% respect and appreciation for his father. We have this off weekend and my wife and I, we go up to a cabin with her family and really long story short, I crash. It was a bad one. I ended up dislocating my foot and my ankle. I shattered my ankle. My best friend through all of this is my dad. Five, six, seven days a week, we're on the phone with each other. And as I'm starting to heal and get better and you know get the pins out and get another surgery, that's when we find out he has cancer. A few days later, my family's in the room with him at chemo and we watch him get that first, first shot into his arm. There would be times when my dad was at the cancer clinic in Kelowna or back at home on the farm in Cherryville and me and Malcolm spelled each other off that way. Like we, we really worked together to try and make sure my dad through his like suffering and that hard time wasn't alone too much. We just spent so much time together just sitting in the living room telling stories about riding and racing and that was like some of the worst memories of our life but also like the best as far as like how close our family became. We're the strong family unit, right? Like how I described us as 12 year olds in the backyard riding bikes together. Dad didn't focus on work, dad focused on family. Now families there focusing on him together, right? I'm actually working out of town and my sister calls me and she says, hey, you, you gotta come home. I said, what, do you, what do you mean I gotta come home? She's like, dad took a turn for the worse today. I was talking to him last night. What are you talking about? He's like, you need to come home. He's like, don't come home at three o'clock today. Come home now. So I, I bail on work. I leave the equipment and guys there and I jump in my truck. I spend the next day around dad trying to talk to him. And as we knew, uh, as we knew dad was slipping away, like my brother, my sister, my mom, we all took a quick one-on-one -on -one with him. And, uh, hit me like a ton of bricks. I'm like, I don't know enough about dad. I idolized my dad growing up. He was my hero. I never told him that. And uh, so I kind of like knelt down at dad. Like, I never told him. <sighs> dad, you're my hero. I've idolized you my whole life. I, you know, if, if I can be half the man you were, you know, I'm, I'm going to be a kid, I'm going to be all right. So I tell my dad and I said, don't worry about mom. Don't worry about mom. I will take care of mom, whatever it takes. We rolled dad out in his bed. <clears throat> Kind of neat, just how we grew up as family unit outside. That family unit came together outside for dad's last breath. He was 52 years old. I was already, uh, I was struggling in silence and had a lot of pain at that point. I went back to working seven days a week with dad's business, trying to help mom, trying to provide, you know, some kind of normality for me, for her, for this. And it just got to the point where like, Okay, I'm, I'm a mess, I'm depressed, I'm not coming out to anyone about this, and I'm just putting on this brave face. And I was doing this race, and I was in this moment where I'm really thinking a lot about myself mentally, this life I've created, this way I'm treating myself. Like, I am not a happy person right now. These corridors in my mind that were like deep, dark places I was just going through and trying to fight and be strong enough alone to get out of them. It's like, I was sitting there waiting for my wife to leave so I could break down and like, did you know that I would wait for you to go to work so I could go into the shower and cry until the water turned cold? I could just run that hot water just so I could ignore the outside world. And I'm on like Google and I'm like, how many people have suicidal thoughts? How common is this? I think I'm thinking, man, like, is, does everybody search this or think this? So it, it took a bit of time after that to realize, okay, I need, maybe I need to reach out for some help. And for me, it was my wife where I finally came clean to her. Like, 
I haven't told you the whole story. Like, there's been years here where, like, I've been down, I've been out. I didn't think that I could do anything without aggression. I needed that aggression. I had to be tough dirt biker guy. I go and I buy a yoga mat. I'm like, I'm gonna go to yoga. This is benefiting me at home, but like, I love heat. I got room for one more. <laughs> over these years, I've had over 20 broken bones, over a dozen concussions, broken both my ankles twice, I've broken my feet, I've broken my knees, I broke my back, I broke my shoulders, I've had all these ligament damages, and like, I couldn't stand on one leg for a year. And then it's like doing yoga, I can stand on one leg, this is impressive. So that gentle side of things really helped my recovery a lot. And then it started to shift me into my mental recovery. And you know, the, the first step of the mental recovery was accepting that I needed that. That was a big thing too, was just, I never accepted, I buried. And you can't allow yourself to recover mentally, physically, anything in life. You can't allow anything unless you accept it. Yeah. Just you, me, and the odds. We stuck together, we two peas in a pod. Get dealt a bad hand, I'm there seizing the cards. We'll never be separated till we see in the gods. We've been low together, high forever. As we go together, we'll die, we'll never be alike. Couldn't let the darkness try you ever. Truth in my word, you I lied to never. And when the world gets a little too hard, wipe your eyes, put away your sorrow. When it's war, I'll be leading the charge. And I'll be still fighting for you tomorrow. Yeah, even with a blindfold or in different time zones Could find my way to you with my eyes closed There's nothing between us Go to Mars and Venus Stand in front of every one of them rocks They slinging and be a shield Now that uh, we've lived close I've got to know Malcolm a little bit better in the last, say, year and a half Away from racing dirt bikes the thing about Malcolm I appreciate more than anything, where he, like, he probably doesn't even know he's helped me this way, like, I've never told him this, but his sense of humor and his um, ability to be positive. And I got drawn to how positive he is all the time. Like, even when he's knocked down, um, he's always just a little bit of high energy. I like that, so, but just very positive. Even if it doesn't work out, he's still positive. 